Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Aydin. I'll be presenting my dissertation defense, um, visual textual video synopsis generation. I would like to thank my advisors, Dr. Shah and Dr. Lobo, for all the valuable lessons they've taught, taught me throughout my PhD, and also valued uh, committee member for attending this session, Dr. Ranavard and Dr. Atia. Um, so as we all know, video content has been growing explosively recently. This is due to the availability of cameras to everyone around the world. Uh, just to give you a few examples, YouTube, one of the biggest, one of the biggest uh, video sharing websites, uh, receives over 300 hours of video content from its users. On the other hand, we have millions of surveillance cameras recording 24-7. Uh, and we have police forces and normal users using uh, body-worn cameras and dash cameras to record their daily activities. So um, we have, um, the, the problem is that we have so much video that we can't ever possibly watch, even though this content is very useful. Um, even um, that, the reason is that uh, these videos have high levels of redundancy, and that's what we want to achieve in video summarization. In pretty much any uh, unedited video, uh, first of all, not all the events are important. And secondly, not the imp entirety of an important event is required to represent it. And that's exactly the objective that we want to follow and achieve in video summarization. We want to be able to convey the most useful information about the video in as short time as possible. Video summarization techniques fall under two main categories. The first category is called extractive video summarization. And as the name suggests, the idea here is that we want to uh, select uh, keyframes or shots from the video, as you can see in this example. These selected units are supposed to be individually important, and the whole set has to be collectively diverse. Otherwise, we are introducing redundancy into the summary. The second category is called uh, compositional video summarization, where we create spatiotemporal synopsis of more than one frame. Um, on the left, you can see the um, original long video. And on the right, you can see its corresponding compositional summary. The idea in compositional video summarization is that we want to merge events and temporal dimension in a way. Uh, even though this is very useful and appealing, uh, it only works in very well controlled scenarios where the camera is static. That's why most of these techniques fall under extractive video summarization. There are several um, applications to video summarization. One of them is movie trailer generation. As we know, movie industry spends millions of dollars every year to create trailers for their movies. But in principle, this can be done with any extractive video summarization technique. The second type of application is for security purposes. As I said earlier, police forces nowadays use dash cameras to record their shifts. Uh, due to the volume of this content, we can't ever possibly watch them all to find relevant information. This is where video summarization can help us. The third type of application is if we use uh, GoPro cameras or body-worn cameras to record their daily activities. At the end of the day, we, we are left with a long video, um, and if we want to get a idea of what happened during that entire day, video summarization can help us by providing a very short summary about that day. There are two major challenges in video summarization. Um, the first one is, call, uh, is due to the subjectivity of problem, and it is difficult for us to say what constitutes a good summary. This could be because different users may have different tastes in the summary, or it could depend on the application. The second challenge is an evaluation. It is extremely difficult to distinguish between good and bad summaries. Um, I'll be presenting four chapters in this dissertation. In chapter one, uh, that is published in European Conference on Computer Vision 2016, uh, we are aiming to tackle the subjectivity. Video summarization is highly subjective, and we can actually confirm this by asking different people to summarize the same video for us. They will come up with different summaries. Our intuition was that different users have different needs, and therefore we need to incorporate their needs into the summarization process so we can personalize this process for them. So the input to our model will be video plus a set of preferences coming from the user, and the output we call it query-oriented summary, and we call this new problem query-focused video summarization. In query-focused video summarization, we expect to see two types of events into the summary. The first event we call it query-relevant events, that directly correspond to users' preferences. And the second type of events are holistically important events. They represent the story of the video. They do not correspond to any query coming from the user, but they're generally important in the context of the video. We believe that the return summary from the system has to reflect both the story and the query. 
So similar to conventional video summarization frameworks, we have a video at our input level. But we also have a set of preferences coming from the user in the form of, uh, so we define a predefined set of concepts that, that the user can select from. In this case, the user has a specified they are interested in seeing cars and flowers. We can train pre-trained detectors on top of these concepts and apply them to video clips to extract features from them. We can also model the user preferences using a request vector where we preserve the value of the concept of interest and we reduce the effect of the remaining concepts. So our model follows a hierarchical architecture. At the top branch, uh, we want to summarize the video with respect to the query. Therefore, the input to this branch is essentially the features that are adjusted using the uh, request vector. And this branch selects some shots from the video that are relevant to the query. At the bottom branch, we try to make the story of the summary complete by selecting some other shots. This branch is no, no longer a function of the query, and therefore the input to this branch is the feature without any further manipulation. To make sure that there is no redundancies introduced between the selections of these two uh, layers, we condition the selection process at the bottom branch on the output of the top branch. This branch uses some other important shots, and we return to the user uh, the union of all these shots. Extractive video summarization can be modeled as a subset selection problem. So given a video, in this case the video has five short shots, the summary of this video could be a single shot from this video, or two of the, these shots, or three, four, or even the entire video. In order to model video summarization as a subset selection problem, uh, we use a tool called Determinantal Point Processes, or DPP. DPP is a stochastic process that allows us to assign probability to every subset of a given ground set. In the case of video summarization, the ground set consists of all the shots in the video. Now let's see how DPP is applied for the purpose of video summarization. So given the video, as we said, we can extract features from it. Given these features, we can construct a positive semi-definite kernel, L, here. Um, and these correlation values in this kernel can be measured with a simple inner product, or we can introduce some learnable parameters, in this case W, to learn the correlation values. Uh, the idea here is that we want to optimize these parameters so we can learn how to train, the, uh, how to uh, summarize a video. So given this positive semi-definite kernel, DPP takes it as input and assigns probability to every sub-kernel that can be extracted from this kernel. For instance, if we want to calculate the probability of item i and j belonging to a certain subset, we extract the sub-kernel corresponding to row and column i and j and compute the determinant and then use this normalization constant here to convert it to, probab to a probability value. So, so far, we've learned that DPP allows us to assign a probability to every subset. However, it's DPP's characteristics that makes it suitable for the purpose of video summarization. Let's take another look at the formulation that we had in the previous slide. So, the probability of item i and j belonging to uh, the subset is this term here. In order to maximize this probability, we need to maximize the individual importance values LII and LJJ. But at the same time, we have to make sure that these two items are as dissimilar as possible, or we are promoting diversity in this case. In the case that two items are perfectly similar, this probability becomes zero. So DPP promotes individual importance and collective diversity, and this was the ideal selection criteria that we required for extractive video summarization. In order to train a DPP for the purpose of video summarization, we introduce learnable parameters in the kernel, and then using video and ground truth uh, summaries that were annotated from users by users, uh, we try to maximize the probability of observing these ground truth summaries at the training. At the test time, we find the subset that has the highest probability. In other words, we go through all the subset and choose the one that has the highest probability. There are certain limitations to using DPP for video summarization. DPP sees the ground set as a bag, meaning that the temporal order in the video, in our case, will be ignored. Uh, or to simplify, if we shuffle the frame or shots in a video and give it to DPP, it will result in the same summary. 
The bigger problem with DPP is that to find the summary, we have to go through all the subset and all the subsets and pick the one that has the highest probability. For a very long video, this is not practical. That's why sequential DPP was proposed earlier. Um, the idea in sequential DPP is to partition the video into consecutive disjoint segments. Each of these segments consists of a few shots. Perf we perform the subset selection at every um, time step that we have. And in order to make sure that no redundancy is introduced between the selections, we condition the selection process at time step t on the output of the selection at time step t minus 1. Having known the D, uh, DPP's probability distribution, it is easy to infer uh, sequential DPP's uh, probability. So going back to the problem of query focused video summarization, we said R model is a uh, hierarchical model. We call this model sequential hierarchical DPP and it is easy to see why. We essentially have stacked uh, two layers of sequential DPP on one another as well as a conditioning happening between the layers. So the middle layer here identified by Z subset selection random variables is responsible for selecting um, shots relevant to the query and the subset, uh, the bottom layer identified by subset selection variable Y is responsible for gathering all other important shots. Comparing sequential DPP with sequential hierarchical DPP, we can easily extend the formulation to infer the uh, sequ uh, sequential hierarchical DPP's probability distribution. In this formulation, Q shown in red represents the query. So the middle layer is responsible for summarizing uh, the video with respect to the query. Therefore, it only selects shots relevant to the uh, user's preferences. At, at this layer, we parameterize the kernel uh, in this format here. As you can notice here, the FIQ is a query dependent feature of a certain shot, uh, and W is a learnable parameter. Uh, to obtain query dependent features, we take those pre-trained detection scores and we adjust them using the request vector that we get from the uh, user. In order to summarize the story of the video or the rest of the video, we introduce another kernel parameterization for the bottom layer. Uh, as you can see, the feature is no longer a function of the query for this layer. And we introduce new learnable parameters V. We also condition the selection process at this time step on the output of the uh, step above it, the layer above it, uh, in order to make sure no red redundancy is introduced between the layers. To train sequential hierarchical DPP, we follow what has been done for sequential DPP. We apply maximum likelihood estimation on the probability distribution. Uh, we also add some uh, regularization terms that uh, we, tr we actually tune their hyperparameters using validation set. At the test time, we employ an approximate online inference, meaning that we summarize the video as we go. In other words, we summarize the video at the first few segments, uh, first segment, select a few shots, use those to summarize the remaining of the video. In our experiments, uh, we use two data sets. Uh, the first one is called UT egocentric. It includes four videos, each between three to five hours long. The second data set is called TV episode, also with four videos, each being 45 minutes. In an earlier work, um, a group in Stanford University collected textual annotations for every single shot in these videos. So they broke down these videos into short shots. They collected sentence uh, for each of those shots that would describe those uh, content. In order to obtain queries, we used the nouns in these textual annotations. So we were able to obtain uh, a dictionary of concept size 70 for UT egocentric and a dictionary of concept, uh, concept size 52 for TV episodes. We designed two evaluation scenarios, one uh, of, for different types of user. The first type of user we call it uh, a patient user. They would expect to see all the scenes uh, related to their query of interest plus any other important shot in the video. An impatient user expects to see few most representative shots that would represent their query as well as any other important shot in the video. To evaluate the performance of our model, we take the video summary that the system has generated, we break it down to its constituent shots, we gather their uh, corresponding sentences, that, and we pull them in a textual document. 
we can do a similar thing for ground truth summaries. And then using any NLP-based uh, text comparison metric, we can compare these two documents. In addition, we introduce another metric called hitting recall. Um, the idea in hitting recall is to find out um, how many shots in the system summary represent the query, and then find out how many shots in the ground truth summary represent the query, and compute the ratio. Ideally, we want to have 100% hitting recall. Uh, to show you some quantitative results, you can see the performance of our approach compared to four baselines on UT egocentric under patient user uh, scenario. So we have two simple baselines, sampling and ranking. Uh, as you can see, the precision values for these simple baselines are pretty high compared to all other baselines or methods. Um, the reason behind this is that these, ba uh, these methods have the prior knowledge on how long the expected summary should be, and hence the high precision value. However, if you compare the recall, uh, they fail, and our method performs better than most, better than all actually. We can see a similar trend uh, under patient user on TV episodes, and finally in patient user on both data sets. Um, so given a video, the Z layer or the middle layer would select some shots from the video that should relate to the query. As we can see, in this case, the query is flowers and wall. Some of these shots clearly represent the query and some others don't. When we look deeper into such shots, uh, we can see that the detection scores for the queries of interest or for the concepts of interest were rather high and hence the method has chosen these shots as a mistake. Y-Layer also chooses some other important shots to make the story of the video summary complete. Uh, I am showing the ground truth summary in text domain as well. Blue here represents the sentences that exactly appear both in the system summary and the uh, ground truth summary. So in this chapter, we designed a video summarization framework that allows us to generate personalized summary. Uh, it can identify which events are dependent on the, are related to the query and which events are holistically important in the context of the video. We also evaluate in the text domain. There are few shortcomings to our approach. Um, first of all, the hierarchical architecture, even though useful, it leads to increased training and inference time complexity. It requires additional supervision for training because we kind of know, we kind of need to know which shots are supposed to be selected by Z layer, which shots are supposed to uh, be uh, selected by Y layer, and this is an extra level of supervision. As for the features, we require pre-trained detector, uh, detectors to extract feature from video clips. This is not good because if we want to add um, a new concept to the dictionary, we have to retrain. Um, and also, since we were the, the first ones to introduce the problem of query-focused video summarization, uh, we did not have a real data set for this problem, and we had to use pseudo ground truth query dependent summaries to train and evaluate our model with. And finally, we believe that the evaluation metric could be improved. These are the challenges that we try to add, address and tackle in chapter two. This work has been published in CVPR 2017. Um, in our first step, we wanted to make uh, our data set more complete and real. So we took the videos from UT Egocentric. Um, these videos are long, they're consumer grade, and they cover a wide variety of daily activities. First, we refined the concept list by removing a vague concept, by merging the redundant ones. We also added some concepts that were dominantly appearing in the video, however, missing from the dictionary. And we also added some top user search terms uh, from video search engines. Our final dictionary was reduced down to 46 concepts in total. Next, we needed to collect annotations on two different levels. Um, we needed to switch from captions to a more definitive and comprehensive type of annotation for evaluation purposes. This is required to compare a system summary against a ground truth summary. And also, for training, we needed real ground truth query dependent uh, summaries so we could train and evaluate the model with. As for the evaluation, we decided to move from captions that were short and uh, not really descriptive of the entire scene to dense tag annotations. So we used the dictionary that we had collected before, we have refined before, and asked Amazon Terracares to uh, annotate all of the shots in all of the videos with the concepts that would appear in them. 
Here's another example of that. As you can see in both of these examples, the caption is fairly short and not really descriptive, but the concept list is more uh, comprehensive in describing the scene at hand. Now, having obtained all of these annotations for every single shot, in order to compare two summaries, a system summary and a ground truth summary, um, each of these shots are represented with a set of tags. To compute the similarity between any two shots, we can compute the intersection over union of their tag sets. Um, and we can apply a maximum weight matching on the bipartite graph that we just formed. Uh, this will result in a, uh, in a score. We can normalize this score uh, with respect to length of both of these summaries to eventually compute an F1-like measure. To collect real ground truth user summaries, we hired three students. We asked all the students to summarize all the videos with respect to all the queries for us. This way, inter-user agreement between the summaries is measurable. And also, we are able to confirm our intuition that the query must actually affect the summarization process. So here, uh, is the summary that one of these students uh, has done for one of the videos, given the query being food and drink. Here's the summary of the same video with respect to a slightly different query, phone and hat, uh, that the same student has done. Um, the shots in green represent the shots that were identically chosen for both summaries, and orange represents the shots uh, that depend on the query. We also wanted to resolve some of the issues that we had in the previous framework. Again, in this fr new framework that I'm going to describe, the input is shot features pl plus the query. Uh, however, we use a memory network encoding. We will see the details of that in the next slide to convert static features of a video clip into query dependent features. Then we use these query dependent features, feed them to a sequential DPP. There's no hierarchy this time for summarization purposes. So let's take a closer look at memory network encoding. So again, the input at, uh, to this part of the network is shot features plus the query. So having obtained frame level features of a single shot and the query, we use a linear embedding to embed the features or transform the features into a new space. We use a second embedding to map the query into the same space where we can measure the similarity between uh, the transform features and the query. We apply softmax on these similarity values to convert them to probability. Then uh, we use a third embedding to map these static features to, a vi uh, to another space and use the probabilities that we just acquired to combine them into a final query dependent feature. Let's um, take a second and see what happened here. So we have a static features of a single video shot and we have the query incoming to memory network encoding. And the output of this network depends on what the query and static features are. So it's a dynamic set of feature now, depending on what the query is. To compare our model with existing state of the art, um, first we ran our experiments on sequential DPP, uh, a crucial baseline to our model. Uh, Comparing sequential DPP with sequential hierarchical DPP, we see a slight improvement in performance uh, across the board. But eventually, when we use memory networks to encode, uh, we see improvements all across the board. To show you some qualitative results, you can see on the left, um, we have a video that is roughly four hours long. And on the right, you can see the summary that is just about eight minutes, so much shorter. The query in this case um, is drink and food. Uh, and as you can see, the video summary on the right already rep is showing signs of the query at hand. Here's another qualitative result. So um, on the left again, there's the original video. And on the right, you can see the summary. Uh, in this case, the query is chocolate and street. Uh, our model is robust to giving wrong queries. In this case, chocolate is a query, is something that is missing from the content of the video. But uh, since we define the problem of query focus summarization to be general, in fact, uh, it is able to handle uh, the prob this problem. So in conclusion for this chapter, we compiled the first query focused video summarization data set. We collected 184 video uh, query um, pair annotations. Uh, we also collected dense per video shot concept annotations that we used to develop a novel evaluation metric upon. 
we also uh, presented an improved framework that had higher performance. It required less supervision for training due to no hierarchy in the structure. And we did not need any pre-trained detectors uh, for feature extraction. Again, there are a few shortcomings to this approach. Uh, sequential, any model that is based on sequential DPP does not allow the user to specify how long the summary should be. And this is a feature that sometimes is required. There is also discrepancies between the ways the model is trained and, and tested. We train the model by applying maximum likelihood estimation on the objective function. However, at the test time, we employ a greedy algorithm and we summarize the video as we go. Furthermore, the evaluation metric that we use has to do something with the tags and bipartite matching on the graph, uh, uh, maximum weight matching on that bipartite graph, and it has nothing to do with the objective function. These are the challenges that we try to tackle in chapter three. This work has been published in ECCV 2018. So as we just saw, uh, to summarize the video with respect, uh, using, uh, using DPP-based models, uh, we essentially choose the subset that has the highest probability. This subset can be of any size. Uh, but it's also a very useful feature if we could um, generate summaries at different granularities. Um, maybe we want to specify how long the summary sh uh, should be. Therefore, we propose and develop a new model, generalized DPP. So since the user may want to specify how long the summary should be, we kind of want to enforce some size prior on, on the new model. Deep, in DPP, the size prior, as we will see soon, follows a uniform distribution. Our idea is to change that and impose a custom uh, distribution as size prior. Uh, we denote it by pi. So here's original DPP's formulation broken down to its elementary DPP. The first summation here uh, is over the size of the subset. So it could be size zero until n. And the second summation is over the content of the subset. So at this, at this summation, we are trying to choose the content. At this, we decide the size of the subset. So if we want to explicitly impose a custom distribution, uh, actually here's where pi will go. It is easy to see that DPP now is a special case of generalized DPP that we just proposed, where pi is a uniform distribution. All we need to do to convert this uh, to a probability value is to compute the normalization constant given in this closed form solution. Next, we develop a sequential model of this generalized DPP. So in sequential DPP, we had this conditional form. Um, and we had this before, we've seen this before. In sequential generalized DPP, all we need to do is to impose that prior uh, as well on the probability. Second challenge that we wanted to tackle was um, about the discrepancy between the model, uh, between the way the model is trained or tested. To train sequential DPP, we apply maximum likelihood estimation on this objective function, which is the log likelihood of ground truth observations. At the test time, we employ a greedy approach to do this, uh, to summarize the video. So we summarize the first segment, and we keep doing this for the remainder of the video. The problem here is that if we make a mistake at selecting correct shots at any of these time steps, uh, these, this error will propagate throughout the summarization process for the rest of the, um, for the, rest of the summary. Secondly, the evaluation metric and the learning objective that we had are entirely disconnected. So our objective, again, is the same as before. Our uh, evaluation metric is a completely different story. We want to design a new objective function that allows us to expose the model to its own mistakes uh, done at the inference time during the training so we can teach the model to recover from making mistakes. And also, we want to incorporate the evaluation metric into the objective function so we can directly optimize for that. Our new objective function, uh, which we call large margin formulation, has two terms. The first term is a sequence level cost term delta that essentially compares the test time inference prediction of the model compared to the ground truth summary during the training and assigns a score to it. The second term is a margin sensitive term M that penalizes the model when the probability of ground truth observations fails to exceed the model prediction by a certain margin. 
So here again, we see the original DPP um, objective function. In this formulation, x star represents the ground truth subset at time step t. We change this formulation to our large margin formulation that has delta and m. In this formulation, x hat t is the subset selected by the model using its own inference time algorithm. So delta compares the ground truth sequence with respect to, uh, and compares the ground truth sequence uh, with the model prediction using the evaluation metric. This is how we involve the evaluation metric in the objective so we can directly optimize for it. As for the margin sensitive loss term M, uh, as we said, we want to enforce a margin between ground truth uh, observation and model prediction. And it is easy to do so. So this is the probability of observing ground truth shots. This is the probability of observing models prediction. And we are enforcing a margin of one in this case. We also collect uh, the videos in social interaction data set um, collected by a group in Stanford University. Uh, these are eight long egocentric videos. Some of them are as long as eight hours. Uh, we fully annotate these videos for generic video summarization purposes and add them to youth egocentric uh, data that we have. We also made improvements upon our evaluation metric. Our, eva our previously introduced evaluation metric was good. However, there was one flaw in it. W uh, the flaw is that it allows matching between shots at any temporal distance. So in other words, the first shot in the system summary can be matched with the last shot in the ground truth summary. We wanted to change this and enforce some temporal restriction on which two shots can be matched. Uh, we use two types of functions, a pi cutoff function and a Gaussian function to enforce this restriction. Now we can evaluate using different function parameters and compute the area under the curve. So we evaluate the performance of our model on two scenarios. Generic video summarization where there is no query involved. In this case, here's the performance that we could get for the baselines that we had. Comparing sequential DPP with large margin sequential DPP, so it's the same model trained with the new objective function, we see major improvement in performance. Comparing sequential GDPP with our large margin sequential DPP, we see slight improvement. So this formulation is only the generalized DPP model. There is no large margin formulation here. And finally, the large margin sequential generalized DPP performs the best. As for the uh, query focused video summarization results, so here's the performance of the baselines comparing sequential DPP again with large margin sequential DPP, we see improvement. Memory network DPP uh, was the one that uh, we introduced in chapter two. Uh, and large margin memory network uh, performs comparably to its um, predecessor. And also we have sequential GDPP that we introduced in this chapter. It performs comparably with the top performing models. And finally, large margin sequential GDPP that outperforms everything. So here in this chapter, we made two-fold improvements on sequential DPP-based model to video summarization. We developed a new generalized model that allows the user to specify the expected summary length. And we also developed a large margin formulation that allowed us to more effectively train these models. Um, so we, we, we also addressed the training and test time uh, discrepancy and also loss evaluation mismatch. And lastly, we made further improvements on the evaluation metric that we designed. There are shortcomings to these approaches as, uh, as always. So our approaches and any other conventional video summarization techniques uh, summarizes the video by creating a shorter video. Therefore, to infer knowledge about what happened in those videos, we still have to go and watch the summaries. Um, and especially if we want to search for a specific type of event, and if our data set is large, this is not going to be a feasible approach. These are the challenges that we try to tackle in chapter four, textual synopsis generation for videos. So here, we want to answer one question. We want to say, we want to find out how we can make browsing video summaries even easier for the user. Our answer was to generate text summaries for the videos. It's fairly easy to read a short 
textual report about the video to understand what happened in it. And we can also use natural language to search within that content to you know, quickly find relevant information. There is a naive approach to do this. So we have the video. We can use any existing off-the-shelf video summarization technique to summarize it and select some shots and then pass it through a video to text network or a video caption generation network to come up with a text summary. There are a few issues with this kind of approach. If our uh, video summarization is imperfect, meaning that it may select bad or repetitive shots from the video, this error will be amplified uh, throughout the text generation. After all, it's a challenging task to generate textual descriptions for egocentric videos. So we propose an alternative approach, which is kind of in reverse order. We take the video, we break it down to short shots, we pass the shots through a video to text generation, so we create a very long textual document. And next, we use a text summarization framework to summarize this long te text to come up with the summary. The advantages of this approach is uh, because Essentially, we first generate as much text knowledge as possible. Some of these descriptions may be correct, some may be wrong. We can identify, we can try to identify which ones are correct. And from the correct ones, we can select the most representative ones. So to show you the framework, we take the video, we break, down to, uh, we break it down into shots, we uh, sample a few frames from each shot, we pass the frames through a 2D CNN for feature extraction. We can use any uh, feature extraction backbone here. The features, the visual features extracted at this point will be passed through a caption generation network that is consisting of encoder and a decoder. This part of the network will produce a description. We take the visual features and the textual description and pass it to a visual language content matching unit in order to identify whether the generated description is correct or not. Next, we have a pair port network that tries to essentially read all of these generated descriptions and from the correct ones, it wants to identify which ones are representative and need to be uh, included in the eventual summary. Our pair port network assigns a representativeness, representative score to each of these descriptions or video shots. Uh, also, we get some confidence scores from our visual language content matching unit. The product of these two will result into impact score for each of these descriptions. Our caption generation network has um, a temporal attention module that essentially is trying to find which of these visual features are useful. The reweighted features will go through an LSTM-based encoder decoder uh, to produce a caption for the shot at hand. We use a standard captioning loss to train this part of the network. Our visual language content matching unit takes, in, takes as input the visual features of a certain clip, video shot. It processes them into a final representation, a representation using a bidirectional LSTM. Uh, it also takes as input the generated description using the caption generation network at the previous uh, component. It also produces a final representation for this description. The product of these two descriptions will form a visual language feature for that spe specific clip. This feature is passed through a fully connected layer that assigns a confidence score uh, whether this description is correct or not. The visual language feature is copied for further use in Pairport Network. So since at this part of the network we are trying to determine whether a description is correct and matching the visual content or not, uh, we are employing a binary classification objective binary cross entropy loss at this uh, part of the network. In our Pairport Network, we have taken all the visual language features that we, we could generate using, using our previous uh, component. We process them using a bidirectional LSTM, and a fully connected layer assigns a representativeness score to every single uh, clip, in, in a way. We also, at this point, we want to find out whether a description has to be included in the summary or not. So it's a binary classification problem. Another uh, binary cross-entropy ob objective is introduced here. Here's the entire framework all together in one slide. Uh, we train 
this uh, network in an end-to-end -end manner by combining all the objective, uh, all, all the objective, uh, objectives together. In our experiments, uh, we used the same UT egocentric dataset. This dataset has been uh, annotated densely with textual annotations. We evaluate our model both in visual domain using the area under the curve uh, metric that we introduced in previous chapter, and also in the text domain using Rouge, Blue, and Meteor. These are the most commonly used metrics in natural language processing. Uh, to compare our model with state-of-the-art video summarization techniques, we took those, we accompanied them with a video caption generation network identical to ours, so our method is not an advantage compared to them. Um, and here is the performance that we could get for all the baselines that we could find. Uh, when we compare our model with the existing work, we see improvement pretty much at every metric. We wanted to find out why our method is doing better, so we ran a few um, experiments. So our intuition was that our model will do better because there will be a lot of noise in the generated descriptions. So to do this, to, to actually confirm this, we took the videos and we discarded everything. We just kept the caption generation network. The idea here is to take the video and generate as many sentences as we can about that video and then evaluate the performance. So here are some of the descriptions that the video caption generation network could produce. As you can see, some of the descriptions are correct. Even though they don't match the actual ground truth description, they are correct in describing what is happening in the video. Some other captions are correct in the sense that the sentence is meaningful. However, it's not describing what is happening in the video clip. And the third type of, uh, the second type of error is where the sentence does make no sense at all. Uh, we evaluated the performance of the video caption generation alone and, um, using Rouge metric, and as you can see, the numbers are not all that high. We also performed some ablation study to do a component-wise analysis to make sure that every component that we are introducing is being helpful. These, uh, this ablation study is mainly concerned about the uh, visual language content matching unit and the purport network. So we should remember that the full model performed 17.33 using Rouge metric. When we completely remove the visual language content matching unit, we see a major drop in the performance. If we keep the visual language content mat matching unit, however, we discard the auxiliary loss that we were using to train it, uh, we see a drop, drop in performance, however, not that much. If we completely discard the Pairport network, uh, we also see um, a rather noticeable drop in performance. This is because we need to know what happened in the entire video to be able to select the most representative one. And finally, for the sake of completeness, uh, we generated caption for all the uh, shots in the video and use a text summarization approach, state-of-the-art text summarization approach to summarize this long document into a text summary. And as you can see, the performance of such model are uh, not good whatsoever. We also evaluated our model on, use on in visual domain. So here's the performance that we could get using area under the curve that we introduced earlier for the baseline. Comparing those approaches to ours, uh, we see improvement even in the visual domain, even though that was not a concern. Here's one qualitative result. Um, so this is a textual summary that the method has generated. Uh, the original summary had 144 sentences, so I cut it short so I can fit it in the slide. Um, but you get a sense of what it would look like to produce a textual description. Here's another qualitative result. So uh, the prediction, the model prediction description is shown in red in this clip, and the ground truth description is shown in green. So to conclude this dissertation, uh, we discussed four different uh, chapters. In the first chapter, we were the first to define uh, the problem of query-focused video summarization. We introduced a hierarchical architecture called uh, SHDPP. It looked like this. In chapter two, 
We used memory network encoding uh, to come up with query dependent features. We introduced a new evaluation metric uh, using visual concept and we collected the first fully annotated query dependent uh, video summarization data set. In chapter three, uh, we introduced a new model called generalized DPP that can be used when we want, when the user wants to specify how long the summary should be. We also introduced a new objective function that allowed us to uh, more uh, train the models uh, more effectively. We also made further improvements upon the evaluation metric. In chapter four, we introduced um, the end-to-end -end text synopsis generation for videos, as you can see in this picture here. We would also like to make some suggestions for the future work. Um, so as you noticed, the form of the query in our work was in the form of a predefined set of words that the user could select from. Um, so th this is okay, I guess, but it would be nice if we can make this change to a freeform language such as in video search engines where the user can write down whatever they're interested in seeing and then uh, we find the query dependent summary. As for text, we use text to either evaluate the performance of our model or to generate the text summary for the video. However, text can also be used to learn a set of enriched videos, uh, enriched uh, features, uh, what is normally called a visual language um, feature embedding. So this can help us better summarize the videos because the more we know about the video from the text domain and visual domain, we can more effectively summarize the videos. And as for the text synopsis generation, uh, as you saw in the text summary generated, the UT egocentric descriptions are fairly short and simple. It would be nice if we could um, collect a more, a, a, another data set that has a more complex set of descriptions and actually more natural as well. Thank you.